Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. On today's episode, we have Breakfast on the Farm in Waltham, Minnesota. We have a conversation about rural health with Shar Reese. Extension educator Liz Stahl provides a new best practice and we have a new focus on 4-H. All here today on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections made possible in part by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned renewable energy producer in Claremont, Minnesota for more than 20 years, producing ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. Back in 1944, Sam Bauer had a vision to provide tires and heating oil to families. This second and third generation family run business is still focused on commercial truck, retread tires, tires for your passenger vehicles and farm equipment too. Novel Energy Solutions, committed to working with farmers and landowners to deliver a new crop, electricity. More about income potential and lease agreements designed to be top performers at NovelEnergy.biz. Welcome to Farm Connections. We're on the Gene Anderson Farm near Waltham, Minnesota. Welcome, Gene. Yeah, welcome, Dan. Thanks for letting us come to your farm, Gene. Well, thanks for coming, Dan. Glad that you could come. Well, there's a lot happening here. And it's obvious you put a lot of work and love into it. Why do you do this, Gene? Well, I guess we do it to try and educate the city people as to what goes on in the rural community. Because there's a lot of the city people that don't have a clue where milk comes from or meat. They just think it all happens at the grocery store. And there's a big process that happens before it reaches the grocery store. Well, a lot of work goes into raising that food as, as people are seeing today, but I also noticed a lot of farm people here too, so they must be enjoying this and learning a few things as well. Oh yeah, and there's some small animals here that people aren't going to see very often anywhere else. So. <laughs> well, you have some conventional agriculture, you have some historical things, and you have some things that are modern day. So we'll talk about that some and we'll get some shots of it, but what's your favorite part of being a farmer? Uh, planting a crop, I guess, and watching it uh, grow and harvesting it. The reward comes at the end at harvest time, so. And how do you think the harvest is gonna be this year? Well, I'm optimistic that it's gonna be good. Well, I'm optimistic too, because if we don't have a crop, we don't have food, right? Right. So we're counting on you. Yeah. And of course, you're relying a lot on the weather, but you've got some things that help against bad odds, like good equipment, good seed, yeah. and lots of technology that's improved things. We've seen yields move a lot, and that's one of the displays that you have in your machine shed. In 2017, you won the Minnesota State Corn Growers Contest for non-irrigated land, right? Yeah, in Minnesota here, yeah. That was amazing. 312 bushels? Yes. How'd you do it? Well, one of the, timing is a big key. I mean, you gotta get out there and get the crop planted at the right time. You gotta have good planting equipment. You gotta have good ground, high fertility, good drainage. And, you know, you gotta have, kind of nurture it along throughout the year. But I always say, once I plant a crop, it's pretty much in God's hand. I, I do the best job I can, and it's up to him to take care and finish it. Gene, you've got a wonderful farm here. It's rich, it's fertile, it raises great crops. How long has it been in the family? Since 1950. How did it come in to get into the family? Uh, well, my dad grew up right across the field, and yeah, they purchased this 80 acres, and then they bought another 80, and since then I have bought a two more 80s, so. So you're growing the farm? Yep. You had cows at the time, and of course that contributes to rich soils because you recycled, didn't you? Yep. And always grew, well, 
a certain amount of alfalfa, which keeps the ground loose and it's sure. really good. Good rotation, put some yeah. nitrogen back into the soil, and of course, corn loves nitrogen. Yes, so you spent some time studying soils. You spent some time studying seeds and fertilizers, correct? Yep. That's right. Well, there's a little more to that story to get 312 bushels, because if you go back to when your dad raised corn, as I remember my dad, when he hit 100 bushels per acre, it was a big monumental thing. You're struggling with in the 80s and the 90s, and all of a sudden you hit 100. Think of that, three digits. And that was a big, big event. Fast forward to 2017, Gene Anderson, you took 100 times three. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. What's the plan for next time? Well, uh, I don't know. I got, uh, let's see, three varieties entered this year. Last year I had three, and last year I placed 10th and 11th in the state of Minnesota, and really felt that I could have placed first, but on the 30th of June last year, well, the last part of June last year, the corn was just growing leaps and bounds, and on the 30th of June, the corn was like six feet high, and we had a severe wind storm that went through here and laid some of the corn right down on the ground and it came up good, but there also was some green snap in there. So in at harvest time, uh, you'd be going along picking corn and there might be, some places there would be like six stalks in a row that were about knee high that were broke off. So you lost six ears there. And then every once in a while there'd be two or three. So that all, affects the yield because, you know, you plant like 36,000 plants per acre, which means that you should have 36,000 ears of corn, at least, plus maybe a few others. Some might end up with a double, but yeah. If we don't have the population and we don't have the stand, we're probably not going to get the yield, right? That's right, yep. Gene, you're no stranger to change and adaption, otherwise you wouldn't be a successful farmer today. But I noticed the equipment from the 1800s. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, there's a variety of equipment on display here from um, horse-drawn corn planter, one-row planter. Uh, got some uh, antique 1930 Model E John Deere spreaders I've restored. Got some old two-cylinder tractors on display, all the way up to the latest and greatest equipment. He's got some nice big equipment, and some in between from, say, the 50s and 60s, the 7, yep. 730, 720? Uh, I have a 630 out there that used to do most of the farming with. Used to pull a six-row planter with it, six-row cultivator, sat out in the open, enjoyed it. And yeah, nowadays, you know, you sit in a cab and it's nice, but actually, you know, a nice day, it's, it's nice to be sitting out in the open. Uh, you get a little dirty sometimes. Yeah. The dust used to fly and you'd come back and looking pretty uh, black in the face, but I don't know, it doesn't hurt anyone. Gene, you've opened your farm up to the entire community. They're absolutely enjoying breakfast, meeting with agri-professionals, meeting with you as a farmer. That must make you feel good. What's the best thing about that for you? Well, it does really make me feel good, and it's, it's really good to see so many young kids here having a lot of fun. And I mean, we're really educating the kids today, which is a good thing, and they're having a blast out here, and that's what it's all about. They're getting educated in several ways, so. Well, it's a beautiful day. Some people wouldn't even open their garage to the public. Think of opening their entire farm, their entire business. People are crawling all over your machinery, they're in your shed. Thank you so much, Gene. Yeah, you're welcome, Dan, and thanks for coming out here. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. Farm Connections, best practices, brought to you by I'm Liz Stahl, Extension Educator in Crops with the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, on today's best management practices, I'm going to talk about fitting cover crops into your rotation. 
Now, there's many potential benefits that you can get from planting a cover crop in Minnesota, but one of the biggest challenges that we have is we just don't have a very big growing season to get those cover crops established. And we need to have enough growing season to have enough growth, again, to reap these different soil health benefits. So some of the easier entry points that we have for cover crops in Minnesota would be, uh, for example, after corn silage harvest, or after small grain harvest, or after a canning crop. Um, also, if you're in a more traditional corn soybean rotation, uh, you could look at seeding that cover crop once corn starts to reach maturity um, and say, you know, the canopy starts to open up or a lot of people are looking at early interseeding of a cover crop around that V4, V5 to V7 stage of corn. Um, in soybean, you do have a little wider window there typically to establish a cover crop after soybean harvest. But again, you could also look at seeding that cover crop once the soybean leaves start to drop and that canopy starts to open. Again, just giving us a little bit more time to get that cover crop established. Now, some recommendations if you're starting out uh, with cover crops would be, number one, you know, what are your goals of that cover crop? Because that's gonna determine what species you wanna plant, uh, what uh, timing of planting, and say if you wanted to graze that cover crop as well, there's a lot of things to look at too, like with your herbicide program that you need to be concerned about. So again, what are your goals of that cover crop? Uh, then look at what kind of equipment do you have available? Do you have access to equipment where you can see the cover crop into a standing cash crop? Um, or do you have access to a drill that would work for early interseeding? Or do you want to do an aerial application? Um, broadcast seeding, again, what equipment do you have available? Then also another recommendation we'd have would be to start small. Um, if you, you know, it's going to be a learning curve if you have any issues with planting the cover crop or termination and so forth. Again, it's going to be issues on a smaller acreage versus a bigger acreage. So again, starting small is a really good idea. Um, also, what species that you want to plant. We'd recommend just starting out with one of our more workhorse type cover crop species like like cereal rye or oats. We know a lot more information about these crops. Uh, for a herbicide program too that we typically use in corn and soybean, we tend to have less issues with establishing uh, these species as a cover crop. Uh, you can get more detailed as you get more uh, experience with planting your cover crop. Um, also, you know, watch your herbicide program again too because again, we don't wanna have that herbicide have too much of a negative impact on our cover crops as well. We want it to control weeds, but not to control our cover crop. And also get help. There's a lot of resources from University of Minnesota Extension. We have a lot of research going on uh, that could be a benefit to you. Um, also your local NRCS or soil and water conservation districts. There's a lot of nonprofits that are doing work with cover crops, other farmers, even your seed dealer too can be uh, a real nice resource of information when you're getting started out in, in cover crops. So again, I'm Liz Stahl, Extension Educator in Crops with the University of Minnesota Extension. Thanks again for watching our best management practices today. Welcome to Farm Connections, and today our guest is Shar Reese from 40 Square. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great, and it's a pleasure to see you again. Tell us what 40 Square means. 40 Square Cooperative Solutions, we are an agricultural health care co-op for farmers mm -hmm. um, and agribusinesses in the state of Minnesota and Minnesota only. We are a self-insured um, co-op which offers seven plans, uh, major medical plans, um, for farmers and agribusinesses around the community, around Minnesota. Well, that's an awful lot. And when I sort through that, one keyword just reaches up and grabs me, and that's the word access. Yes, yes, absolutely. Why is that important? Well, in the state of Minnesota, we are fortunate to have um, great um, insurance uh, providers. However, there aren't as many um, as it relates to access um, that reach all uh, corners of the state. And so that was a concern. And so 15 years ago, actually, Cooperative Network, the state's trade association for co-ops in Minnesota, and United Farmers Cooperative out of Winthrop, um, they really got together and did a survey of farmers stating that the con growing concern for farmers and anchor businesses to stay in business um, and to pass down the farm to the next generation that above the cost of inputs and the price of commodities was health insurance. So, and the access and affordability to it. So, um, Cooperative Network went to Congress, received um, funding for an appropriation for reserve funding to start a healthcare co-op in Minnesota um, and one in Wisconsin. 
because um, they're a two-state trade association. And we, it was a 16-year journey to get us to where we are now to have a, another option for farmers and agribusinesses in the state of Minnesota. I was working with a producer once and he said, Dan, my health insurance costs for just the health insurance alone are well over 30000 for my family. And I said, how are we going to find enough earnings on the farm after tax to come in and buy insurance? Health insurance and health care is not inexpensive. It isn't. And what, but what we aim for, at least in Forty Square, but what we should aim for as a collective general public and especially um, in rural communities is price transparency. Um, knowing where you can get where you can get the best service at the best cost. And I would think is, and it's tough being a healthcare administrator of a hospital or a clinic, but I would think that would cause them to pause and say, we do need to be diligent about being competitive in pricing and transparency. Have you seen that effect? Yes, there are uh, more providers that do want to provide that type of transparency. However, because of the healthcare system is so complex, and whether or not a person is on, you know, is a private payer, um, just paying on their own out of pocket, or whether a person has insurance, the cost varies. Mm -hmm. And so, it, I believe it, it is a challenge for healthcare providers to be able to provide what that base price is for that service, regardless of whether or not you have insurance. And there may be different qualities levels of quality inside of the state of Minnesota with healthcare as well? Yeah, that's correct. That is correct. And it varies by region as well. So um, we in the state of Minnesota is very diligent about, um, in general, the state um, is very diligent about assessing that, that quality um, for providers around the state. So it does vary. What's next and what can the viewers do to help? Get your annual physical. Um, I know it's a pain sometimes, but really it's very important to be able to um, assess your current health, but what may be some precursors to something that you could prevent that may be um, worse. And so I really want to put a, a kind of a public service announcement <laughs> for everyone, whether or regardless of whether or not you're in the ag community, but especially the ag community, um, to go get that physical. Um, but as far as um, options for folks and what they can be able to do is ask questions. Ask questions when you go to um, your doctor. Say, is this, you know, what exactly do I need? Um, is this necessary? Um, you know, what will the cost be? Um, and where, and think about what are your options, you know, for getting, you know, that whatever procedure um, done. Um, but to learn more about health insurance in general, I would encourage you to obviously um, talk to your local broker or agent um, because a lot more, because of the dynamics again of farming and the egg economy, incomes are such that where you may not have qualified for federal subsidies before with Minsure, you now may qualify. And so, um, there may be, you feel like there might be some stigma of taking, folks may feel some stigma of taking, uh, you know, federal subsidies, but taking that, I know there, there's some pride, but taking that and having coverage for you, your spouse, or your family is much better than going without. So, Shara, you've talked a lot about healthcare, but there's components with inside healthcare. You know, the physical part, the emotional. What about mental health? I know growing up, we didn't talk about our feelings on the farm. It was get up, get out, pick rocks, grade potatoes, and um, get the work done. But the um, at night, um, and you know, at some points throughout the, the day, um, the, the, the reality of where we're at right now um, with the egg community, um, you just need somebody to talk to, somebody to identify with. And farming can be many times a lonely profession. You're in the cab by yourself. You know, you're getting some things done, you know, with your hired hand here and there in smaller operations. 
but um, there are now, fortunately, because there is a raised awareness, unfortunately because of um, you know, some um, suicides and other awful instances um, within Minnesota, but in general with the depressed ag economy, there is more awareness for resources um, in the state of Minnesota um, that has been also led by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Well, mental health is certainly a key area for us to be cognizant of, pay attention to, and help people. So if we, de if we detect somebody has some mental health issues or we have concerns, what should be done? We should ask. We should, um, first of all, talk to that person. Ask how they are doing. Um, and while I am not a, a mental health professional, Dan, um, talking, um, even though you might not get a response, um, is, um, is paramount. But also, um, ask how you can help. And even if, generally, folks will say, no, I'm fine, I don't need any help. Just a matter of doing something um, and asking, letting, letting them know that they care, talking to you know maybe some neighbors or some friends um, that may help um, as well. But seeking the um, by calling the you know the hotline um, that Minnesota Department of Ag um, mm -hmm. has, um, even if you're not the one experiencing those those um, issues talking to somebody you know, on that helpline um, or at your doctor's office um, may be helpful for you and they can help um, you help the other person. Thank you, Shar. Thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate it. Great information. You're a champ. Oh, thank you. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. Hello, my name is Megan and I'm a Rice County 4-H'er. Today, my 4-H club, the Webster Rolling Workers, is going to clown for some younger 4-H'ers. What does that mean, you ask? Come with me and I'll show you. First, we have to get ready. Now that I'm in costume and makeup, my, I go by the name Daisy May. This is one of the great things about clowning. It gives you a chance to be someone you're not and it gives you lots of room to gain self-confidence. Another big thing I learned from clowning is flexibility. As you can see here at this event, we have two stations, balloons and temporary tattoos. Now, depending on crowds, I might have to jump around between the two. These two things, self-confidence and flexibility, help me be a better leader, which is one of the best ways clowning has helped me. I love Connor so much. I get to grow personally, I get to see other members grow, and we get to bring smiles to him it. And most importantly, we get to promote the amazing organization 4-H. Thank you for coming with me today to see what 4-H calling is all about. Again, my name is Megan, or Daisy May, for the Web Street Workers 4-H Club. A warm Minnesota evening in St. Paul provided a comfortable setting for conversation. In this case, the exchange was between two groups whose paths don't often cross. Members of Twin Cities Moms Blog and women farmers involved with Common Ground took part in an evening of food preparation and conversation about where that food comes from. Food is obviously a very personal thing. Everybody needs it, everybody feeds it to their kids, their family, and it is important to know where your food comes from and is, you know, the population gets more and more urbanized, it's harder to know and be connected with an actual farmer. So that's where we come in. We are farm women, just hoping to share more about where your food comes from, how it's produced, 
why we care and why we do the practices that we do. The point of tonight is just to come together, make some food, gather, and have a great experience, but also to hear about what these farmers are doing. Um, I think people forget how much of a business a farm is, and it's really cool to highlight what um, these families are doing in their communities. Common Ground is supported by farm organizations like the Minnesota Corn Growers, who recognize the need for farmers to talk to others outside of agriculture. For Twin City bloggers, it's also a chance to meet face-to-face -face with the people growing their food. I think farm to table has become so prevalent now and we understand kind of what that means but we don't know who the people are behind it. So I think putting the faces to the food is really cool to do. Um, but also I, I grew up in a farming community and it's so much work and so I think just to bring a highlight to all the work that those people are doing. So when you go to the grocery store you connect that food to people. I think bringing that relationship in is so important to do. What it comes down to is everybody cares about where their food comes from and that farmers are doing the right things and that things are being treated properly, whether it's the earth or the animals. And we all want the same things. We all want a healthy, safe food supply. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. Life on the farm is hard work. It's important that we take time to enjoy the moments with family and friends that hard work provides. I'm Dan Hoffman. Thank you for joining us on Farm Connections.